here the Apostle Paul is writing his second epistle that we have penned for us in the New Testament. It's believed that he probably wrote somewhere between three or four letters to the Corinthian church. We only have two divinely preserved for us in the Bible. I'd love to know what were in the other two, but it's not given to us to know. But here, Paul is writing to this church to commend them and also to find out how they're doing and to tell them how he's doing. Now, the first letter we have to the church at Corinth, he's very, very blunt to them. He speaks to them about some issues that were arising in their congregation. There were some schismatics among them, some who had uh, followed after men, some Cephas, some of Apollos, some Paul, and some of Christ. Some disregarded the preaching of the, the gospel altogether and said, listen, I'm of Christ, I'm not of any of you, and so disregarded the ministry. He rebuked them for doctrinal error, some that said the resurrection was past already, and he rebuked them for some immorality issues that were in the congregation. Well, he's writing this letter, this epistle, to kind of give them a little bit of peace of mind and to let them know how he's doing and that he is thankful for what they have done, but also he is defending his apostleship throughout this entire epistle. You'll notice that theme starting at the very beginning where he talks about suffering, acknowledges his suffering, and says, listen, I've suffered, but it's for the purpose of the furtherance of the gospel, to even telling them later on in this epistle that, yes, my bodily presence may be weak, but it's not about me. When I am weak, I am strong in Christ. So here in the second chapter of Second Corinthians... He's went from acknowledging his own suffering. You'll notice that in the first chapter where he talks about God is our comfort in all tribulation in verse 4. To then in the second chapter, he begins talking about forgiveness and forgiving the brothers who had erred in their walk with Christ. I like how he says in the prior verse directly before describing to us how he has been turned back and forth a little bit and things haven't went how he wanted to. He talks about forgiveness when he says that to whom ye forgive anything I forgive also in verse 10 of chapter 2. For if I forgive anything to whom I forgave it for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. He goes from talking about trouble to talking about forgiveness to then describing how he wanted to go to the Corinthians to tell them this in person. You'll notice in verse 12 where we began reading before the uh, speakers decided to catch something and make us all jump a little bit. There in verse 12, it says, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. What's happening right now, right now is he is able to go into a certain area and preach. Now, there are two ways we have opened doors for us. And as we see that we are made to triumph in Christ, this is very important that we understand that God is who opens and closes doors in every aspect of our life. And here, as he says, I went in, it's not saying that a door was opened and then he walked through it. Now, sometimes it is that he opens a door and then we walk through. But sometimes it is in the midst of our journey that doors are opening without us even knowing it. Sometimes we may be plowing in a field that we are trying to utilize what we have for the furtherance of the gospel, and God is blessing in that moment with an open door. We were already doing something, right? So I've seen people talk about open doors in this way that they sit back and say, well, until God opens that door for me, I'm just going to sit back and just wait for it. And lo and behold, 60 years down the road, they're just still sitting back and waiting for it, <laughs> right? Sometimes God opens a very vivid, obvious door in front of us and thumps us in the head and says, go. That's happened to me in my life. I'm sure it's happened to you in yours. But most of the time, I would say, we're just simply plowing, and God blesses the open door in the moment of us serving him. And so here, Paul is following the Lord's lead. He is being blessed by God to preach the gospel. But at the same time, even though God is opening doors, he has no rest in his spirit. Why is this? Now, when it says, because I found not Titus... I think it is implicit that he had affection for Titus as a son in the ministry, but Titus was also an evangelist, which was kind of the side person beside an apostle. 
you see in Titus chapter 1, he sends Titus to Crete to set in order those things that were wanting. So it's probable that Titus has been sent to Corinth, right? Titus is sent there. He wants to hear of what's going on, what's happening in the assembly. How is it that they are doing? Have they repented of the errors? Are they mad at me, right? (laughs) That's kind of probably the feel Paul has. What is going on inside this assembly? And he says he has no rest because he didn't know what was happening at that church. You see, the image we're given is Paul is very concerned with the pastor's heart about what is happening at Corinth. Now, Paul is typically thought of as this master theologian, right? We see the book of Romans and say that is Paul's systematic theology. That's how I look at it. Paul's systematic theology is found in the book of Romans. And we see his words written to us and we think, man, he was smart. But never miss the fact that everything he did, even as he wrote the doctrine of God penned in the scriptures, it was always done from the heart of a pastor. It wasn't done for his own ministry. It wasn't done to build himself a name. He had a name prior to following after Christ. He gave that up because he loved his Savior and from that had a pastor's heart. So he had no rest within himself. He found not Titus. But taking leave of them, he went into Macedonia, and then it says, Now thanks be unto God. This is a strange set of verses because he says, What I wanted to happen didn't happen. I'm wanting to find Titus. I'm wanting to see him. I'm wanting to hear how the Corinthian church is going. And you'll see this throughout most of Paul's journeys in Acts. It was never this clear cut, put it in the GPS, and let's run with it, right? Now, that is how I like to do things. Now, I will admit that I'm a little bit more adventurous than Rebecca. If she ever falls asleep in the van, I'm, she may wake up and not know where she's at. One time we were coming back from um, Paola, Kansas. I think that's how you pronounce it. And we were coming back, and I said, which way you want to come back? The way we came. She said, I don't care. I'm going to take a nap. Well, she woke up somewhere in the Ozarks <laughs> and said, where are we? I said, you said you didn't care. <laughs> not my fault. So she woke up. You know, I like an adventure, but still an adventure that I can control, right? Even in my adventures, I like the ability to set it in the GPS, see how long it's going to take, see what stops are on the way, look up where's the closest Chick-fil-A, look up where is the closest place I can get food, I can, where, is there a Walmart in case I need something, I can see what I'm doing and where I'm going. I like adventures, but controlled adventures. When you look at the book of Acts, you're not going to see a clear-cut GPS. Paul says, here I go, here I go, here I go, and it's all controlled by me. When you look in the book of Acts, you're going to see Paul just roll with it. It is just moving in one direction and then another direction and another direction. I can't imagine the type of anxiety he felt as there was, you know, we talk about the new norm. There was not a norm with Paul, right? I guess the norm would be constant calamity. He didn't know what he was going to happen next, where he was going to go. He was under house arrest once in Rome, then he got out, and then he was going to go to another place another time. And the whole time, it's never what he expected. I like to know what to expect, even if it's not something I want. If it's something I'm not looking forward to, at least I know it's there, and I know I'm going to expect it. I like that. Paul didn't necessarily have that. Paul looks and says, listen, I went to preach, God opened doors. Now notice this, God is opening doors in spite of the inability to control the situation. He had not rest in his spirit. He didn't know what was going on with the Corinthian church. He didn't find Titus, his friend, his brother. And then he went into Macedonia. Imagine what we've experienced over the past six weeks amplified through our entire lifetime. Our entire lifetime. I really don't want to think about that. (laughs) My schedule has been uprooted. I was enjoying getting into a groove. I told Rebecca over the past couple of years, it's been frustrating because, you know, I've been in class, I've had a job, I've been in class, then I have a child, then I have two children, then I have three children. Um, We're here, we're there, we're at that church, we're at this church, and it's just, I told her I'm looking forward to a schedule and to something that I could expect. And then all of a sudden, I'm getting some semblance of a schedule, and then boom, it it all changes. Well, I'm sure you're probably the same way. You're used to Sunday afternoons with family. Some of you are probably used to, let's say, ballparks, um, enjoying going out to the movies. We have a certain schedule that we eat every single night, and then all of a sudden, it all stops. It ends. 
Imagine that over a lifetime. Imagine that over an entire ministry. I would have probably not said, now thanks be unto God. I would have probably turned around and said, can you believe this? <laughs> or turned around and said, can you believe what our government did this time? <laughs> Can't they just let me get back to the plans that I had? Can't, let me put it in my GPS. You know, we, we have a trip planned in the next couple of months to the beach, and we've been sitting there watching as to see what the governments were going to do. And I'm like, you better open up. <laughs> <laughs> because you're not taking that from me, right? Well, they didn't turn around and complain what Paul does here in verse 14. He doesn't turn around and say, it didn't work out the way I wanted it to. I am so angry. He looks and says, now thanks be unto God. The first thing that I want us to get from this is triumphing in Christ is that to be able to triumph in the situation, we have to change our perspective. In therapeutic terms, I know I've mentioned that a few times over the past couple of months. Uh, you can tell that I've been way too into books and reading things in my secular vocation. But in therapy terms, it's called reframing. You're changing your view from what you think it is to what it really is. And sometimes we may see something from a different perspective than what is reality. Um, reality, there is one true fixed objective truth of what is happening at any given time. But at the same time, the way we perceive it may not be as it really is. And so as we look at something, you can ask somebody, somebody may see an instance, an occasion, maybe a car wreck, and you ask, the police officer goes around and asks everybody what happened. Everybody's going to give a different account. Why is that? Because we're all interpreting it through our own lens. And so something that we have to do in every situation, in every trial of life, is to turn around and reframe it and change the perspective from defeat. And this isn't meant to just be a pep rally. You know, sometimes it's pat on yourself on the back and feel better about yourself and you really haven't done anything. Now, you're still in this turmoil. Paul's change of perspective doesn't change the fact that everything isn't working like he wants it to work necessarily. But he's changing it from a hum humanitarian or human perspective, a human secular perspective, I mean, to then changing it to a view of God's perspective. Now thanks be unto God. He turns around and sings praises. He turns around and says, though it's not working like I wanted to, I've told you of my suffering throughout the entirety of the first chapter. I know it wasn't broken into chapters then, but I'm just using that language. I'm telling you, here at the first part of this epistle, I've suffered. I suffered to the point, as he says in verse 8 and 9, he says that he suffered to the point that he was pressed without measure, above strength, insomuch that he despaired even of life. That language is signifying that he was pushed to the point where he couldn't be pushed any further. Despaired even of life, mourned living. Have you ever been to the point where you just mourn the fact that you're alive? You mourned that you were even living to experience the situation. Paul says, I've been there. He looks and says, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Notice the very vivid language he uses to describe his suffering. Yet when he gets here to verse 14, he looks and says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. He looks and says, Even in spite of my suffering, I am made to triumph. I am made to be victor in Christ. So the first thing we have to realize is that we're changing our perspective. Now this word triumph, as we get to the next principle that is going to be found in that same verse, the word triumph has a specific Roman meaning as it is attached to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. If we just think of the word triumph as being victory, we're missing the point. Because triumph is to embody something greater than just this word. Okay, in Roman culture, you would have them go out and conquer civilization. They would go out and conquer what would, hap what would happen then is they would turn around and come back into Rome. Like any good um, conquering nation, they'd want everybody to see what they did, right? They would say, look at what we did. Look at how we've destroyed our enemies. Look at the spools of war that we're bringing in with us. And so a Roman triumph was after they went and destroyed a nation, 
they went and were victors, they would come back in and they would have the spoils of war. They would have everyone that was on the opposing military chained up, walking in in front and burning incense. As you're going to see the word savor here used in a minute, they would burn incense to where you'd hear the smell the sweet savor of victory. And so the image here, he's attaching it to our life in Christ, but he says we're made to triumph. Think of your life right now, despite the complete inconsistency of any type of normal schedule, in spite of an economy that may tank, in spite of the fears around us, in spite of everything that may plague our mind and our heart, in spite of all that, the Christian's life is a victory parade. That is literally what our life is. It is a life of walking in this small time that we are given in victory. That is what we are. We are literally a living embodiment of a victory parade. And so right now, as he says, we're always made to triumph in Christ. He's grabbing an analogy that they would fully understand. And then he says the second thing. We're changing our perspective first. We're changing our lens of interpretation. We're seeing things through victory in Christ. We're not getting down and saying, I've suffered so much. Now I'm just going to be angry. But he says, now thanks be unto God. He praises God because he understands that he has victory in Jesus Christ. So he changes his perspective. This perspective, actually, before we go to the very next point, this perspective so motivated Paul as he's writing that he sidetracks from what he's talking about in Macedonia in verse 13 until he gets to chapter 7 in verse 5. You'll notice that he begins to talk about the wonderful grace we're given in Jesus, how we've been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. And he talks about how we have this treasure in earthen vessels. He gets sidetracked from chapter 2 all the way to chapter 7 just because he is so motivated by the grace of God. Talk about a change of perspective. And if you ever get frustrated that I may run down a rabbit trail, don't, because Paul does too. (laughs) He gets sidetracked and begins to go down a rabbit trail of God's grace. Well, change of perspective. The second thing you'll notice, it changes our purpose for the reason we're doing what we're doing. And maketh manifest. He causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of knowledge by us in every place. Here, he then says, not only are we made to triumph, but the purpose of our life is also changed through the change of perspective. We go from perspective to then purpose. He says, he maketh us to triumph and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Now, when he uses this word savor, it's giving the thought of that incense on a Roman triumph. In other words, you all should smell. (laughs) You all have a smell. Now, I don't mean that in a derogatory term. There was a brother in a different state that none of y'all know here that Rebecca and I would laugh because he'd always want a big bear hug, and we could smell him for the next three days because of the amount of cologne that he wore. And we, we, we would start using his name almost as a verb that we got and we'd use his name because we'd smell him for three days. That's not the kind of smell I'm talking about. It's not a bodily smell. Now, we all smell. Boys smell. Trust me, do boys smell? Girls have a distinct little cute smell. Everybody's got a smell. But the smell here that we are exhibiting is not one of the physical sense, but it's metaphorically speaking of how our lives are imaging and portraying the gospel to everybody that we meet. And in reality, with this metaphor that Paul uses, everyone really has a smell. We're emitting something to everyone that people are taking in. If it's happiness, we're giving people happiness. If it's sadness, we're giving them that. If it's anger, if it's sin, whatever we're giving away from ourselves is what people are taking in. But what the Christian's purpose is is that they are to be a savor or the smell of Christ, the smell of God. That is the purpose that we have. He describes this further as he says, 
the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Notice that it's everywhere we go. It's not just one place, but it's everywhere in our lives, in our work, in our church, in our family. It is to be there in every place where we are at. This gives the thought of an overruling theme of our life, an overruling principle. In Colossians chapter 3, you don't have to turn there, but I'm just going to read it real quick in verse 23. It says, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men. It's giving this image of an overruling idea, an overruling umbrella over our lives that's not to be categorized in one place, but it's one that rules everything. It is literally, as the word is, our presupposition. It's our underlining understanding that controls everything in our life is this one principle that we are doing everything as unto the Lord. You can say, how can I take the trash out unto the Lord? (laughs) Well, do it happy. Yay, I have trash to throw out, right? (laughs) I have excess. You see, everything can be placed into this category of doing it with a happy heart. I've told my children this before. There are some things in life that we have to do even if we hate it. Sometimes sweeping the floor is not my favorite thing to do. Sometimes cleaning rooms are not my favorite thing to do. Doing dishes, not my favorite thing to do. There are some things that I am just not that keen to do. Yet, they have to be done either way. And so the attitude in which we take to it may change how we do it. And so as we are changing our perspective, we're understanding our purpose is to do it unto the Lord. And it actually makes it easier in all honesty. When I'm doing things because I love the Lord, it makes the burden much lighter as I'm doing it. It's not hard to do it. Why? Because I'm doing it to serve my Savior. But specific to this part of the text, what he's giving us is a view of how our life affects those around us. You see, I gave a general principle there as how it is supposed to be a view of all of our life, how our purpose is to serve God, yet a specific sense in which it is given in the text. In verses 15 and 16, Paul writes, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of of life unto life. The view he gives is that wherever we go, we're giving off a scent, but it's reacted to in two different ways. To those who have life, it smells good to. To those who do not have life, who are not in Christ, it is death to. Notice the very vivid language. It doesn't say that it's from death to life here. It doesn't say that we're the saver that gives people life, but we're the saver that manifests what they are. Paul wrote to Timothy that the gospel brings life and immortality to light. It does not bring life and immortality. Christ is the savior. We are the saver. Think about that. Christ is the savior. The Holy Spirit is the savior in which he quickens us by divine grace. God is the savior. But we are the saver. We manifest from those around us life or death. Now, there's two reactions here. And the image we're given, again, is the Roman triumph. You have the parade marching into Rome. You have this parade. You have those that were the victors, those that won the battle. And then you have the prisoners of war chained up coming in with them as a testimony of the victory. The whole time, you see all this gold, all the silver, the jewels. You see all of this. You see Rome being surrounded with people cheering them on, and they smell the sweet savor of the incense coming up, signifying their victory at the very front of the parade. Well, you can envision that those to whom were Romans, they smell that as it's coming in, and they say, we won. Do you smell it? Do you smell the incense? We have victory. We weren't defeated. But to those in chains, what do you think that sweet savor smelled like? It smelled like death because that smell signified their defeat. It signified judgment against them. So as we see here, the type of savor that we are is going to have two reactions. It's going to have two reactions around people. People are either going to be happy when they smell it 
People are going to be happy that you are a lover and a believer in Jesus Christ. It is life unto life. It manifests the principle within them, or it is what? It is death unto death. It is going to be something that they hate. And I will tell you, people don't mind if you are a moral person. People don't mind if you are an individual who wants to help others. If you are a humanist and want to help society and you want to better society, but the very second you tell them that your foundational presupposition or view for which you are doing everything is because you love Jesus Christ, it's a light switch. It changes everything. You mean that's why you do it? Yes, that's why I do it. And it gives this principle, life unto life or death unto death. It's one or the other. It's a Roman triumph. And literally, our lives are this. We are walking through this parade of life, giving off the scent of the gospel, the victory we have in Christ, and to some it is loved and to some it is hated. So here, we are given this view of our purpose. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved, and in them that perish. He then asks in verse 16, and this is a humbling question that he gives for us to contemplate as we're thinking of what we have to do. Typically, when I think of my own responsibilities as a pastor, I kind of shrink a little bit to think that people know me in the community. When I first began to preach, it took every ounce of strength in me to say, I am a pastor. That was the hardest sentence to say. It's because I understood my own inadequacies, but also I understood that everybody else in the community of which I grew up also knew all my inadequacies. They remembered Josh Winslet from way back when. Some of y'all don't know how bad I really was. I was horrible, a horrible little wretch. And so when I think of who I was to be able to say that I am a savor of life unto life and death unto death, I am a sweet savor of Christ, it's intimidating. And I think for every believer, there is a sense of inadequacy that we have if we're honest with ourselves in the way that we approach our workplace and our families to think that I am to manifest the gospel as a parade of victory for the gospel. That is very humbling. It's one of the reasons why it's hard to sit down and have family worship with our wife and children. They know me better than anybody else, and it is intimidating to think that I have to lead them not only as husband and father, but as pastor. You yourselves probably think, you know, who is sufficient for these things? I can't do that. I'm not a Roman, I'm not a Roman triumph. I'm not a, I suffer from discouragement and fear and depression. I suffer from sins that so easily beset me. I suffer so much from so many things. I, I, I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm, I, I work too much. I don't work enough. I'm not financially secure enough. I don't have enough clout. I don't have enough influence. Whatever it is, Paul embodies that here and says, who is sufficient for these things? And the answer is no one. You're not sufficient. I'm not sufficient. None of us are sufficient for these things. This is why later on in the text in verse 4 of chapter 3, and such we, such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Amen. You're not sufficient, and neither am I. But the sweet savor of of a victorious Savior is sufficient. You see, sometimes people will say, I I don't want anything to do with Christians or hypocrites. Listen, struggling with sin or unbelief is not being a hypocrite. Everyone struggles with that. I I watched on Facebook people battle back and forth, and I try to stay out of it for the most part because I, I don't have time for it. I post happy things, right? Pictures of cute babies and boys and, and, and a dog and my wife and, and Bible verses and occasionally um, maybe a curmudgeon thought. And, you know, that's what I post. And I try not to argue online much because it's unprofitable. But as you watch people online and people are so fearful of, they may be fearful of COVID-19 and you have people condemning them. And then you have people that are fearful of the government 
that are condemning the people that are fearful of COVID-19, that are fearful of what's going to happen next in the economy, that are fearful and fearful. And it's this constant feeling of inadequacy. And we think after all this, there's no way that we can present the gospel effectively. Brothers and sisters, in the midst of trial, of not having your GPS set to where you want to go, Paul didn't say, I sit back and give up. He looks and says, no, we're not sufficient. But the gospel is. And Jesus Christ's gospel is sufficient in every moment, in every trial, every single time that it doesn't work out the way we want it to work out, the light of the gospel is sufficient in our lives and to feed those hungering for it in our communities. It's sufficient. You're not, but your God is. So he asks this kind of proverbial question. You know, he looks and says, uh, I, and who is sufficient for these things? No one is. We're not sufficient for our purpose. We're not sufficient for what we were made. We're not sufficient to do what we need to do. We will fail if it was up to us, but it's not up to us. We are simply the messengers through which the gospel is presented in our communities and our lives. And then finally, he looks and says, in verse 17, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. He moves from our perspective to our purpose. He speaks of our power here, and I'm not purposely naming it peace. It just happened that way. And when he speaks of our sufficiency in God, our power, to then finally moving to the final principle, doing it, doing it now, knowing that God is present. He says we're not as many. There were some in the Corinthian church that had corrupted the word of God. There were some that came and said they were apostles who were not. You'll remember that language very vividly. Paul would warn of false brethren who crept in unaware. There were some that came in wanting a following, and Paul would condemn that. And so... Paul says, I'm not like them which corrupt the word of God. I'm not doing it for my own personal gain, whether it be a following or financial gain. And I would say those things are closely related, but sometimes you can see men, they don't really care about the money, they just want the clout. Some men don't care about the clout, but they want the money, and it's kind of this thing that comes together and it creates this dynamic that is hurtful to the sheep. He says, I'm not like that. I'm not doing it simply because I want people to follow me like a cult. But I'm doing it with sincerity. I'm doing it with a pure heart, a pure mind. And this is why his motivation of doing this, his motivation of changing his perspective to one of victory in Christ, to remembering his purpose as a triumph parade, a triumph victory in Christ, the reason that he was remembering that though he was insufficient, yet his Savior was sufficient, the reason he did all of this was because he was doing it as he was in the sight of God. He says, speak we in Christ. There is a sobering, overreaching theme throughout all of Paul's writings that is a constant reminder that we're not simply the captain of our own ship sitting back and just doing what we kind of want. My children often wonder how I figure out what they're doing Sometimes they think they're sly, right? They're, they're downstairs and they, they, they think they're sly and they're doing something they shouldn't. Now, occasionally they get me. They've gotten me a few times. But even when they're out back or out front, I have the window open and about every 10 seconds I'll go and peek to see what they're doing. There's authority watching over. Daddy's there. I, I don't know if it's because I, I watched too much TV or NCIS and see all those horrible things they present on fake TV shows or if it's because of social work, but I'm a little bit paranoid of a parent. <laughs> Not a hover parent, but I watch them a lot. And I always remind them that, don't you start fighting, I'm right here. And then I'll hear a swing. And then, you know, sometimes when I call you all on the phone and five seconds later I say, I got to go, I'm not really making that up. They really are fighting. <laughs> My boys, they're boys, right? Me and Ben did the same thing. One time my brother went to school with scratches from the very top of his head all the way down to his chest, and my mom said, it wasn't me, it was his brother, and it really was me. You know, that's what boys do, they fight. You know, I'm always on them, I am watching you. 
it's sobering to think that my life is watched by the God who redeemed it. It's sobering to think that it's, when I say my life, it's really not my life. You know, at the beginning of all this, we thought my life has been turned upside down. My normal is no longer there. And we should come back to this final point that Paul says of doing all of this with sincerity, but as of God and the sight of God speak we in Christ. It wasn't your life to begin with. It wasn't your normal. Your life is God's. And if we adopt that final perspective of reminding ourselves that ultimately we're God's, it changes everything else before it. Because regardless of what happens... If it doesn't get back to the way I liked it, it's okay because I'm God's and ultimately my life, regardless of the norm, will be to the glory of his praise. Because if everything is turned upside down, if nothing gets back to normal, it's okay. My purpose is to be the sweet savor of Christ in this life because God has purchased for me as my savior savior, the next life. May we adopt this mentality, proper perspective, our purpose, our power, and then finally the sobering reminder that this is not our life, it's not our norm, it's God's. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, thank you for the blessing we have in your Son, Jesus Christ, to keep things in perspective of what he has done in our hearts and what he has done on the cross. Knowing that, Lord, we would not have this life to be manifest in the hearing of the gospel apart from your sovereign work in us, that we would be as those that it was death unto death to. But Lord, we thank you that you have made your son known to us. That Lord, we by faith behold him as if he was crucified on the cross before us, knowing Lord that he has died for us. Gracious Lord, thank you for your love, your kindness, and your grace. Let us, Lord, have your gospel transform our minds to remember that in all things, even when life is not as set forth as we would like it to be, that, Lord, we have triumphed in you. And, Lord, let us from that adopt the perspective that whatever we do will be to your glory as a victory parade in our life. Gracious Lord, thank you for this image you've given us through the pen of the Apostle Paul. Let us adopt it in the coming weeks as we see things get back to whatever that norm may be, that our life be under your authority. And amen.